knot theory, a field that's not just about shoelaces and bow ties. It's a field that has proven to be crucial for both the development of pure mathematics and the advancements of the modern world. But did you know that there were nine discoveries that followed one another without which knot theory would not be possible? Knots as a concept goes back centuries, but it's important to mention that they had no mathematical meaning whatsoever. Well, sure, they didn't have any mathematical meaning. But for starters, what were the first knots? Celtic knots were some of the first widely used knots appearing across their entire culture. They were loops without a beginning or end, and historians think that they might have symbolized eternity or the unending cycle of life in nature. There's also something known as Chinese knotting. It's like knots that carry meaning, be it blessings, happiness, prosperity, love, etc. But these all were cultural things. Now, let's get into the real stuff, the mathematical study of knots. So, how in the world do you start to question knots mathematically? I mean, before becoming a field in math, knots were just something practical. Things we used in tying objects together, boats, fishing, clothing, whatever. Well, the first time we saw knots as something mathematical came from the work of Alexander Theophile Vandermond in his 1771 work Remarks on Problems of Position. You know what? I actually thought knot theory came after topology, so it was like a byproduct of topology. But it started long before topology even became a field. Yeah, it wasn't formally called knot theory at that point. But it was the first time we started looking at knots. Vandermond was interested in how elements like lines or points could be interlaced or arranged together. Imagine you have three ropes laid out on a table, each end connected to one of the two posts. Vandermond's interest would lie in the ways these ropes could be intertwined or braided, and what characteristics remain unchanged despite the twists. All this without cutting or untying the ropes. We don't really know what spurred him on to question that, but problems like Euler's solution to the seven bridges of Konigsberg problem were similar trends at the time. All right, and how did that get picked up? A hundred years later, Carl Friedrich Gauss came up with the concept of the linking number. It is used to measure how two closed curves or loops in a three-dimensional space are intertwined. Imagine you have two loops, A and B. If they are not touching or crossing, the linking number is zero because they are completely independent with no linking at all. Now, take loop B, lift it and pass it through the center of loop A once. B passes through A from the top and comes out the bottom before looping back to the top. In this setup, the linking number is either plus one or minus one. And how do you determine which one? Decide on a consistent direction to follow each loop, like always clockwise or always counterclockwise. If the top loop crosses over the bottom loop from right to left, from your perspective, this is considered a positive crossing. If the top loop crosses over the bottom loop from left to right, this is considered a negative crossing. Since loop B goes under loop A and emerges on the other side from left to right, this is a negative crossing or minus one. The total linking number is the sum of these evaluations at each crossing. So if there are several, you would add them up to get the final number. If you guys are enjoying this video, please like and subscribe. And sorry to ask, but why in the world did Gauss study that? I mean, how do you even come up with that? Gauss introduced the linking number as part of his work on the integral that measures the interaction between two closed curves. But it became something fundamental for topology and not theory. And when did we get to the fields being labeled not theory specifically? So. A few things happened. Fluid dynamics and vortex behaviors became mainstream, and Hermann von Helmholtz made some advancements in that. His theories, in turn, influenced Lord Kelvin, or William Thomson, who proposed that atoms could be modeled as knotted vortex tubes in the ether. Obviously, now we know this to be super off. But at the time, it inspired the father of knot theory, or at least I would call him that, Peter Guthrie Tate, not this Tate right here. Tate, along with influence from Thomas Pennington Kirkman, was the first to systematically classify and catalog knots in his work on knots, published in the Transitions of the Royal Society of Edinburgh in 1877, thus creating the first comprehensive tables of knots based on their properties and complexities. He used methods such as counting the minimal number of crossings to distinguish between different knots. Tate's work included the formulation of Tate's conjectures, which addressed the properties of alternating knots and the behavior of knot diagrams. 
Essentially, Tate was the first one to classify knot theory as a mathematical discipline in itself. I mean, obviously Kelvin's theory was dismissed because we figured out that atoms don't work that way. But the mathematical interest in knot theory continued to grow independently. There were contemporary advancements done by James Clerk Maxwell, who further extended Tate's tables. But the next big step came when Kurt Reidmeister introduced what are now known as Reidmeister moves in 1926, which became a cornerstone in the study of knot theory. They are essential because they provide a way to determine if two knot diagrams represent the same knot. If you can transform one diagram into another using only these moves and as many times as needed, then the two diagrams are considered to represent the same knot. Reidmeister identified three basic operations that can be applied to these diagrams. Type 1 move. This move involves creating or removing a single twist in a strand of the knot. Imagine taking a small section of the rope and twisting it to form a loop where the rope crosses over or under itself. Type 2 move. This move involves two adjacent strands that can be passed over or under each other. Essentially, you take two parallel strands and either separate them by pulling one over the other or bring them together so one crosses the other. Type 3 move. This move involves repositioning a strand that passes over a crossing point of two other strands. Essentially, you slide one part of the knot over a crossing or X point formed by two other parts. And why do we need them? Reidmeister moves are powerful because they allow mathematicians to explore the fundamental properties of knots. And all of this without changing the knot's actual structure. By applying these moves, we can simplify or alter the appearance of a knot diagram and at the same time maintain the most important properties of the knot, which are crucial for analyzing and categorizing knots. There's another development called knot invariance that appears to have the exact same purpose, doesn't it? Actually, yes. Both Reidmeister moves and knot invariance analyze knots based on properties that do not change under certain transformations, but they do it in different ways and serve different roles. An example would be the Alexander polynomial, introduced by James Alexander in 1923. Let's take the trefoil knot. It's the simplest form of a non-trivial knot because it cannot be untangled into a simple loop without cutting it. The Alexander polynomial helps to distinguish the trefoil knot from simpler knots, like the unknot, which is just a simple loop, and other more complicated knots. So, if you have two knots and they have different Alexander polynomials, they are not the same knot. The Alexander polynomial for the unknot, a simple loop, is 1, delta of t equals 1. Since the polynomial for the trefoil knot is different, t squared minus t plus 1, it confirms that the trefoil is indeed a non-trivial knot. The polynomial t squared minus t plus 1 is symmetric when you substitute t with 1 over t and then multiply by t squared, the highest power of t in the polynomial, indicating that the trefoil knot is chiral and has a particular kind of symmetry. So they are used to study and understand the deep properties of knots, beyond just their visual representations. But there was a powerful breakthrough in 1984 when Von Jones introduced the Jones polynomial. It's a knot invariant, like the Alexander polynomial, but it is distinguished by its ability to capture more subtle features of knots and links. Von Jones developed the Jones polynomial while working on von Neumann algebras in operator algebra, a completely different area of mathematics, but it ended up being groundbreaking for knot theory. It is calculated using a method that involves analyzing the knot's diagram, or the way the knot is drawn. The first step is to look at the diagram of the knot. Specifically, you focus on the crossings, places where one part of the knot crosses over another. For each crossing in the knot diagram, you apply certain rules. These can change the crossing or consider different ways the strands could pass over or under each other. Each different arrangement or state of the crossings is considered separately. Each state that you identified gets an algebraic expression assigned to it. This expression depends on the orientation of the crossing, whether the strand goes over or under, and from which direction. The final Jones polynomial is found by taking all these algebraic expressions from each state and combining them. It's interesting how it was developed along with topology and yet separately. Yes, a great example of that is hyperbolic knot theory. It's a field that combines elements of topology, geometry, and group theory, largely credited to the work of William Thurston in the 1970s 
and 1980s. Before Thurston's work, knot theory primarily involved studying knots and links in Euclidean space. However, Thurston introduced the idea that most knots and manifolds could be understood through hyperbolic geometry. A knot is called hyperbolic if the space around the knot admits a hyperbolic geometry. This means that this space can be equipped with a metric of constant negative curvature, turning it into a hyperbolic manifold. But so far, these knots are limited to a 3D space. Were they developed beyond that? Virtual knots were introduced by Louis Kaufman in 1999. This concept was a very important development because it allowed for the exploration of knots beyond the traditional constraints of a 3D space. A key feature of virtual knots is that they include virtual crossings, which are not actually crossings where strands physically overlap, but rather indicators of crossings that could potentially occur on a more complex surface. These are crossings in a knot diagram that are marked differently from classical crossings. They don't represent an under or over relationship, but rather serve to indicate crossing information that cannot be represented in a plane without additional context. How cool! And how recent, too. Yep, but that's not where it ends. Kovanov homology, introduced by Mikhail Kovanov in 2000, is a method that extends the concepts introduced by the Jones polynomial, which provided limited information about the knots. It involves constructing a chain complex associated with a knot diagram. Each link in the diagram contributes to a graded module, a mathematical structure, and these modules are linked by differentials. By applying homological algebra techniques, including taking homology of the chain complex, Kovanov extracted invariants that categorize the Jones polynomial. Kovanov homology links knot theory with other areas of mathematics, like algebraic geometry category theory, and homological algebra. Now, check out this video if you are curious to see how topology was developed. See you there!